uh, we're going to talk about event-related fMRI and how we model the hemodynamic time series in order to, you know, like make sense of things that are happening in the brain through the ball signals that we get in the scanner. And this is really, we've talked a little bit about this, but this is really of utmost importance because essentially you're trying to make sense of things that are happening in the brain by the order of milliseconds by uh, measuring something that you call ball signal that happens by the order of seconds. It depends on what your uh, parameters are. And also the relationship between these two is not so simple. Like I, we know that there's a relationship between the two through this phenomenon called neurovascular coupling. But in the process of making assumptions and transforming the data in many ways in order to you know, uh, extract conclusions from your data that makes sense, you need to make really sure that you are modeling your data in the right way. And um, if we, so if we zoom out and look at sort of like the whole process that, you know, covers the SPM course from pre-processing to uh, group inference, uh, probably, you know, we're going to be focusing on the bit in the middle on how the things that we need to take into account when we build our design matrix. Uh, what is a li general linear model? Like how do we build it? Why do we build it? Uh, what is important? And how do we structure parameters? And, and you know, like what is going to affect our parameter estimates that are going to allow us to do to make inferences? However, what I will say is that a lot of the of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, really something that you would be wondering before you start collecting data, when you are actually designing your experiment. Uh, some of you uh, might have already a data set and you're desperate to analyze it, um, in which case it's fine. You know, it's just things that we need to take into account and things that we need to know in order for you to know the data better and uh, model your data in the best way possible. Uh, so just to have a little overview of what we're going to cover. First, you know, we're going to make the distinction, the easy distinction between what is a block or epoch design and what is an event related design. Then we're going to focus a little bit of an event related design. So we're going to talk first about the advantage of uh, event uh, fMRI and also the disadvantages. Then we're going to get more into the nitty gritty of, you know, um, what is the math underlying all of this? Like what does SPM um, to make sure that your event related design and your ball signal is convolved in the right way to extract uh, conclusions from your data. Uh, we're going to talk about like temporal basis functions, so all the different shapes and things that um, uh, looks that the ball signal uh, might have and how we can model it and how we can uh, know things about properties about your ball signal. Then we're going to talk about timing issues, which is a massive thing in fMRI, and we're going to see a little bit better why. And then at the end, we're kind of like wrap up everything and, you know, sort of use all that we've covered to to really take into account and really try to get our uh, model as efficient as possible and optimized as possible. Cool. So with the overview done, let's move on to our very first extinction, which is, you know, uh, what is a block design and what is an event related design? Um, so, so I know I'm, I'm looking away from the screen because where I have my presentation. But I'll come back to you every once in a while. Um, so you, here you have two examples uh, where the red dash light represents the ball signal that you collect and the green light represents the model of what you think is happening uh, in, your, uh, in the brain according to your uh, stimuli. Um, so if you remember from maybe from what's been covered, ball signals are delayed by a few seconds. So you know, if you see here, uh, the, the ball signal that characterized by these stimulus doesn't happen straight away, but it happens a little bit delay. And it also we have like temporal characteristics of the ball signals, so, you know, that goes up and down, it decays, et cetera, et cetera. So if we really wanted to, you know, um, look at the main effect, you know, like what activates in the brain um, when we show, for instance, in this case, pleasant images uh, versus unpleasant images. Um, something that would make sense to do would be just to stack and group a lot of unpleasant images together, one after the other, and present them in that order in, in a block, uh, followed by a period where nothing happens. So we have a, sort of like our baseline period, followed by a block where we present a lot of different uh, pleasant uh, images together. That way they can we sort of compute the average between all of these ones versus all of these ones and then we can make our nice comparisons um so this means that although the signal is delayed and somewhat stable you should be you know still able to sort of like model it in the in the best way possible however this is how it was done sort of like classically uh, however, a little bit later, people um, started realizing that if you have enough information, once they started knowing a little bit more about how the ball signal looks like, how the ball response function looks like, the hemodynamic response function looks like, 
Uh, if you have enough information about that and you have enough information about how you are organizing your events, like your different stimuli um, throughout the scanning session, uh, you can probably model them individually. So what we see here, you can probably like present them in different order, like at different stages, and you can model the response to each one of these stimuli individually. Um, and we are going to see that there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Uh, but that is essentially the main difference between a block design and an event related design. In one case, we're looking at a group of stimuli of the same kind together and we're computing the average. And on the other, on the other tab, uh, on the event related design, we are really modeling separately. Right. So why do we love event related designs? Um, well, first of all, um, they allow to uh, randomize the order of your stimuli. So for example, um, why would you want to do that? So if you present a batch of stimuli of the same condition at once, for example here, um, not only do you introduce ex expectations uh, and bias in participants within the same block because they really they know what's going on, but also cognitive bias. Because for example here, if you were interested in knowing the difference between unpleasant and pleasant images, and you were showing this block um, compared to this block, um, people not only would already, you know, like lose the sense of novelty of what's going on, but also they might infer that the, the relationship between these images and what you're looking for is a bit different. Maybe they think that you're presenting images of animals versus images of wintery stuff. So all those cognitive bias, bias are going to um, have a huge impact on your final results. At the end of the day, we're talking about people's brain and how they think. So what they think about your stimuli makes, uh, makes a huge impact. However, if we have an event-related design, then that means that we can randomize the presentation of the uh, stimuli. So we can now put them in the order we want. So then we kind of get around this issue and make sure that people don't make sort of like conclusions about what you are trying to present, um, conclusions that you don't want them to make. Right. Another advantage of event-related designs is that they allow for post-hoc uh, subjective classification of trials. So what do we mean by this? Uh, well, sometimes you don't know what trials, uh, what type of trials are until the participant tells you. For example, I run quite a bit of pain studies where, and we know that, you know, like when you present as a, a participant with the same stimulus of the same density over and over again, sometimes the person would feel that uh, the stimulus is more painful than others. So for me to be able to compare the painful stimuli to the non-painful stimuli, I need to be able to model each stimulus independently and then ask the person which ones are painful and which ones aren't. And that way I'm going to have my classification of trials. But I wouldn't be able to do that if I had them blocked altogether. So here we see another example. So imagine like this authors here at the, end of the 90s that you were interested in knowing like what happens in the brain, what activates in the brain when you are presented with words that you then remember versus with words that you are just considering familiar or versus words that then you forget. So in order for you to be able to know which words are remembered and which words are not, you need to ask participants after they come out of the scanner. So you present participants with words in the scanner and then after they come out, you present them the words back and then they tell you which ones they remember, which ones they recognize, which ones they familiar but not sure, and which ones they definitely forgot. So in this particular situation, you will never be able to block the remembered words and the non-remembered words. That is also going to look different for each individual. So you need to be able to model, uh, model each one of the stimuli separately, and then you're going to be able to assign them to one category or another. Another reason for using event related design, and this is like similar but different, uh, some events can only be indicated by the participant. And I'll give you an example here. So um, mainly most of you might have seen these pictures before. So these are pictures that sometimes you see one thing, sometimes you see others. So the one on the left here, sometimes you see sort of like a vast type of thing or trophy on a black uh, background. And then sometimes you see two faces looking at each other on a white background. And on the right here, sometimes you see a young woman looking back. Um, and then some of the times you see sort of like an old lady with pronounced nose and chin, and that's the mouth. And like your representation of the same image changes from time to time. So if you are interested in looking at what happens in the brain when participants switch from one representation to another, for instance, by telling them pre pre press a button as soon as your representation changes, you need to be able to model exactly the moment when they press a button. That is something that by definition, you're just not able to block. 
Um, and then sometimes events cannot be blocked due to stimulus context. So let's look at, for instance, if we're, if we're interested in knowing what happens when we present participants with novel um, stimuli or with different stimuli, for example, here. This is a very common task. It's called the oddball task, where you present uh, participants in the scanner with the same type of stimulus in time, and then all of a sudden, boom, you get an oddball, you get a, a, um, an image that is different, and you're particularly interested in knowing what's happening in the brain when they see something that's different. Again, by definition, you cannot block novel stimuli together by the whole definition of what novelty means. Um, and then last but definitely not least, uh, regardless of how your stimuli are organized and event design, is um, very often going to capture variability in the data that might be closer to reality uh, than a block design. It doesn't mean that it's more efficient, uh, but in, in many cases, it's going to be probably uh, more sensitive to different sources like changes. So for instance, here, if we look at the example uh, of the very beginning, um, here on the bottom, we have the exact same sort of like experimental design that we see on the top that we have our block design. However, we can still model our design as an event related design. So we can still model each one of these events um, separately. So, you know, um, this is also something to take into account. If you already have a data set and you were not able to make decisions over the design of your uh, of your data, then you should know that you still have options. You still can think about what you think is better for your data set. Which takes me to the next slide. Um, your design, so what you actually do in the scanner and how stimuli are presented can be blocked or intermixed. But uh, you know, models uh, for block designs can still be epoch or event related, which is essentially what I was uh, talking about. So an epoch, just a block, it would be a sustained period of stimulation. So our model in that case will look something like this, or regressive, something like this. Like there's stimulation here, then there's no stimulation here, then there's stimulation here, et cetera, et cetera. A delta function, which essentially every time we talk about delta functions, we're talking about the spiky things here. So these spiky guys are my delta functions and they denote events. So something happens there, right? And something happens there. The reality is that if your events are very close together to a certain, so if your events uh, so or your stimulus onset synchrony, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, how close or far apart your, your uh, events are, um, if your SOS is really short, uh, once you convolved your um, your design to the to the HRF to the ball response function, uh, your model is going to look pretty much like this, which is essentially um, identical to how it looks uh, if you had done a block design, if you had modeled your data as a block design. So I guess for this reason, um, you know, actually SPM what it does now by default is that if you just give uh, um, SPM information about the onset and about the duration of your trials. Uh, if the duration of your trials, uh, if the duration of your events, sorry, is uh, greater than zero, so there's a duration sustaining time, it's just good. SPM is just going to fill it up with little events because it's really not going to make a difference once you group all those events together. Uh, however, obviously the decision is going to have an impact on your uh, parameter estimate. So here we see an example. So imagine that we have one block where we are presenting words uh, every four seconds. So there's one word every four seconds. And on the next condition, we are presenting words um, a little bit faster. So one word every two seconds. And here we see two examples. In the first example, we've decided to model this as a block. So I'm gonna have all my slow presented words together and then all my fast presented words together. Um, and then you build a model and you fit the data to that model and then you start some parameter estimates and according to what you get here, you would say that in that particular region of the brain, the brain responds, the response to um, words uh, presented faster is higher than when words are presented slowly. Cool. Now imagine that with the exact same data, you decided to model it as an event related. So in this case, I'm gonna model each one of those words separately. So when the rate is um, slower and when the rate is faster. Now, if we model it as, a, as an event related design, at the very end, at the inference level, we might strike the same conclusion. So we might still say, yeah, so it seems like this part of the brain responds more when you present uh, words faster than when you present words slower. However, if you look at the parameter estimates, if you look at the beta 
um, uh, values here, you see that the beta value here is uh, greater on the slower words than on the beta value uh, for the um, for the faster words for the event related design. And this is because in this case, thanks to the fact that the, the events are a little bit more spread apart, the model is, be, is being able to model each one of these responses individually. However, when the words are presented a little bit faster, it's no longer able to do it. So there's, there's going to be like certain like interaction effects between like how your how your events are presented and how your events are modeled that might have an impact on your parameter estimate. If this is getting a little bit over your head, just take home message. You might extract same conclusions from um, um, block designs and uh, sorry, block modeling from event related modeling. Uh, but that is not always going to be the case. And even if that is the case, um, your, how your model uh, estimates uh, your, your data from what you're given it is going to differ. So do make decisions uh, depending on what your data looks like and depending on what you're interested in. Try and make informed decisions about whether you want to treat it as a block or as an event-related design, because there might be interactions between the two. Right. And to finish this part, like everything in life, event-related designs also have some disadvantages. Firstly, they can be less efficient for detecting effects and block design. So we were saying, as uh, I was saying earlier, the block design seems to be the most efficient way. We're going to talk about that later. Um, so yes, this means that sometimes uh, defining short lasting discrete events might be uh, less sensitive than averages across the whole chunk of volumes. Um, but yeah, as I said, we're going to get to that. And secondly, in the same way in which sometimes, depending on what you're interested in, you cannot block stimuli together, sometimes you cannot uh, describe single events um, discreetly uh, because of the nature of whatever it is that your question is. Maybe sometimes, you know, um, maybe sometimes uh, you're looking, you're interested in knowing differences between uh, switching from one emotional state to another. If you want to induce different emotional states in people inside of the scanner, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, that's just not something that you might be able to do in, you know, like one second. So maybe you need to like look at, you know, like um, uh, extended periods of time within the scanner. And then maybe the block design is better for you that way. So, you know, event related design, yeah, uh, good for a lot of things, gives you a lot of uh, freedom to do a lot of different designs. But careful, because sometimes it might not be the best option. So it depends on what you're looking at. Right. And now let's get into the area that might scare some people who don't necessarily have any statistic or imaging background, or maybe you're a complete newbie, in which case you're also welcome here, so don't worry. Um, and this is a question of how SPM really models your ball data to produce results based on the, give you, on the info that you give it. So in essence, what do we really mean when we say model the data, first of all? Uh, one, what do we really mean when we say that we can move the bold uh, data in the GLM? to obtain the results that uh, allow me to make inference uh, about brain activity patterns. Uh, so this is what the next couple of sections are going to be about. Um, so if you, again, if you are new to this, just bear with me. Um, give it a chance. Don't give up as soon as you see a, a, you know, like a graph that you don't understand. I'm going to make, do, make my best to make this as accessible as possible for you. And just remember that sometimes if you're struggling to follow equations, if you're for, uh, struggling to follow, you know, like how a function looks like or whatever it is, just try to concentrate on the concepts, try to concentrate into what we really try to achieve at each step. That's going to be the first step. And then you can make your way into like more, you know, um, your mathematical and statistical concepts. But right, first of all, to start, what is the bold signal? What is the bold response? And for context, uh, and just to give a little bit of a, you know, like a brief summary, bold, what it does is that it provides an indication of uh, oxygen exchange in the, in the blood, in the brain. So if, as you assume that if there is an oxygen demand somewhere in the brain at a given time, then we assume that part of the brain might be doing something because it's, it's needing food. Um, so here we have an example. So for instance, at a given part of the brain, this, imagine that this is a voxel. voxel. Um, at a given time, so time zero, we have a stimulus. And if that particular part of the brain responds to that stimulus, then what you're expected to see is a bold signal that has an initial undershoot, then it peaks around like four to six seconds later, and then it starts decaying. And then it has a late undershoot, and then it kind of sort of goes back to baseline after around like 30 seconds. So this would be like the 
you know, your good old ball response function that, you know, seems to, you know, model the data pretty well. Um, and this, we know that there are certain parts of the brain where this ball signal looks very similar consistently uh, all the time for everybody and across all these different parts of the brain. However, we know that this is not always the case. This is neuroscience. This is not an exact math. Um, so we know that this ball response function is going to, it's going to be a good starting point, but there are going to be certain like properties of it. So for instance, like when it starts, when it peaks, at what intensity does it peak? What is the shape? That is going to be a little bit different from one part of the brain to another. So that is a problem, um, you know, right? Because you you really want to characterize the, the bold response within each area of the brain and within each individual in a, in a you know, in an accurate manner. So, um, in order for you to be able to characterize the bolt response at each individual in each part of the brain, like you would have to have a stimulus and you would have to collect data for 30 seconds to fully characterize what the, this function looks like. Uh, so this means that your SOA, so your, your time in between stimuli would be like almost 30 seconds. Like you would have literally two stimuli per minute. We know that that is not efficient. And we know that most of the time you're not going to be able to afford to have people in the scanner for that long. And that is also not necessary. Um, because we also know that if you present um, successive stimuli closer together, uh, which we can, and you know what the, the, the generic uh, bold response function looks like, which we do, uh, and you assume the bold responses add up linearly with time, uh, you can use sort of like backward techniques, deconvolution techniques to model each one of those responses. So again, you don't need to know exactly, you know, for now, like how that happens and how it happens, uh, if this is new to you, but just so you know, you don't need um, to have two stimuli per, per minute, like you can put them closer together and we're gonna see um, a little bit later what uh, and what things we need to take into account. I'm gonna move, here we go. Right, and now we move to uh, the famous general linear model. So what is the general linear model? Like, what, what, why do we go about this all the time? And then again, I'm going to stress again, like if the equations are going a little bit over your head, just focus on what I'm telling you and focus on this, on this uh, diagram here, uh, because it's a lot easier than what it looks like. So essentially, my general linear model is a function that looks like this. And this has two main components. So you have UT, which is essentially information about my stimuli. So you have your delta functions here, like your speaky guys. So you have information about when your stimuli happen, when they start, and for how long, and what is the, you know, the period uh, in between them. That's information you input in the model because you know it. And then on the other side, uh, you have a function of what the hemo hemodynamic response function looks like, what the ball response function looks like. And I know you can see three different lines here. We're going to go into it about that. But just, just in general terms, you have on one side, one of your elements would be the information you input, and the other one would be the information about how we think the ball response function looks like. And then you, you have your error element. If you convolve the two and you sample that at each scan, you end up, what you end up here is with a function at the same matrix where you have function at each uh, voxel, each um, scan, where you have data multiplied by um, a parameter estimate plus your error variance will give you predicted data. And that predicted data will be an indication of how well your model uh, fits, your, uh, fits your data. So this is what we have on the general linear model. Input on the information of the design, input on what we think the bold response looks like, convolve the two, and we build a model with that. Right, and just to put this into context, let's see that with an example. So like, we have our paradigm here. So for instance, in this case, uh, we have a sound that is presented every 20 seconds. So we input U uh, T, which is this bit here. So it's our delta functions of like every 20 seconds, there's gonna be a sound. So that is what we input uh, in the scanner, uh, sorry, in the scanner in SBM. Then we have our um, temporal basis functions, which we're going to go through in a minute. So these are the functions that are telling me how do I think the bold response looks like, or how do we think the bold response looks like, and how we can characterize differences in bold responses across the entire brain. 
Uh, so with that, if we convolve the two, we end up with three regressors. So we have one regressor for each one of these functions according to this stimuli, and it's going to give me at the end of the day, um, you know, like when we perform an F test, uh, which um, essentially the question that we're asking is, uh, where in the brain are these specific moments where a stimuli, a linear combination of these regressions uh, explains the variance in the data well? Where does my uh, the data fit my model well? And if you do that, you see that uh, the results show you that uh, the data fits particularly well the model and the temporal lobe here. So this is the auditory cortex. And this you know, makes complete sense because our design was uh, focused on sounds. We were presenting sounds every 20 seconds. So that makes sense. So that's just an example of what you would do with uh, the general linear model. Now, remember when I was saying earlier, um, oh, we're going to talk about uh, what these different functions uh, mean and how we account for differences uh, in shape and properties of the bold signal. So this is what we're going to see on this uh, next uh, section, um, and it's what we call the temporal basis function. Now, obviously, from a mathematical point of view, um, uh, these are key for GLM, right? Uh, because uh, you know uh, we really want to characterize the bold signal in the worst way, in the best way possible. However, this is something that SPM does uh, for you once you want to add, uh, you know, like once you select your temporal basis functions. Uh, this is something that um, you know, SPM is going to do for you. You're not going to have to sit there and like calculate this yourself. Um, so if you find the next slide confusing or if, you know, like you need to sort of like have a little bit of an overview and zoom out a little bit on what we're doing, just know that, um, yeah, so instead of assuming that all the bold responses look the same, what SPM does is, is uh, combine different options. So for instance, temporal, uh, like functions that give us information about temporal properties and function that give us information about shape properties, plus our canonical um, uh, function uh, to make estimations that account uh, better for what the reality really looks like. Um, so we're going to see some examples here. Oh, here you go. Right. So uh, here are four options. I'm pretty sure that the, all these options are um, available on our SBM. However, I'll tell you now the the one that you are most likely to use will be uh, the set of functions here uh, that we're going to get to in a minute. But we're going to start um, with the first two here. So uh, all of this uh, will be able to model your bold signals uh, model. Sorry, your bold signals. Uh, some of them are easier than inter to interpret than others, um, and we are going to know why in a minute. So first of all, we have these first two. Um, so this set of functions here is called the Fourier set, um, and for some of you um, who might have done like any modules in psychology or anything like that, might have loving memories about uh, the Fourier uh, decomposition, uh, which basically means that uh, by applying different weights to each one of these functions here that like work at different frequencies, we can um, combine them linearly. You can reconstruct pretty much any shape within a window of frequency. So within this frequency and this frequency. Um, so this means really that we can, by applying weights to each one of these functions, we can reconstruct a ball signal that might look in many different ways, which is great. Um, but this is really difficult to interpret. I mean, like if you told me that one of these functions has a positive load of, you know, five or 50, um, it doesn't really tell me much. I don't really know what that means in terms of like, where, where, where's the undershoot? Like where, where does the bold signal peak? I don't really know. Um, so this is quite difficult to interpret, although it's quite flexible. Uh, the second one is perhaps a little bit more intuitive for, for, to understand maybe. Um, so each one of these functions here, here model uh, a different portion of time of the bold signal. Uh, so this one seems to be like two seconds at a time. So by combining, again, similar thing like here, by combining the weight of each one of these time beings, uh, we can model the shape of any bold signal. But again, um, this only makes sense once we combine all these uh, bins and one parameter in particular is not really going to tell me much about what is going on in terms of, you know, hemodynamic responses. Then we can move on to gamma functions. And now we start we start to see something that resembles a little bit better what a ball signal looks like. So here we have like this set of functions. There are three of them. Uh, and each one of them is going to give me information about some property of the ball signal. So this one, like 
um, where the initial undershoot is, where the peak is, uh, or where the late undershoot is. But then again, uh, the interpretation of this uh, still needs of uh, inferences via an F-test. Like one uh, function on its own is not going to be able to model my ball signal. And that leads us to the very last one, which is the informed basis set, uh, which is the one that, um, you know, um, by default, um, SPM offers when you're doing your data analysis. Uh, it's probably the one that we all use more, more, most commonly, unless, you know, you have, um, I think SPM also offers the option to model your bold uh, response function by yourself. Like if you have a very specific hypothesis of what you think the bold response function looks like, but unless you're very, very motivated to do that and you really know what you're doing, then probably you're going to stick to the canonical. And we're going to see what that looks like. So here, uh, let's start from the very beginning. The canonical HRF is a function that's composed by two gamma functions, and it looks like your good old ball signal. So, you know, like what you would think the ball signal looks like. And this is a kind of like the, the, the general one, right? So this is essentially the best guess of what we think the ball response looks like in general. And we've seen this over and over again during this presentation. But we know, as I said before, uh, that's it. This is not an exact math. So, for instance, our peak sometimes will be earlier, our peak will be later, uh, and the undershoot will have a different shape. Uh, so, the way in which we account for this is by adding a different function. It's a temporal derivative. So, this function, um, the way it works is if the data fits well within the model um, when this temporal deri derivative has a high uh, positive value then that means the ball signal peaks a little bit earlier and decays a little bit earlier. If this function has a negative load, then that would mean the, the peak of my ball signal uh, happens a little bit later and the undershoot also happens a little bit later. So essentially, if just by summing the two, so I don't need to do like complicated inferences now, just by summing the two, I get my ball signal that now resembles a lot better what is happening in the brain. Um, so what's happening in the brain, more like what the ball, the actual ball signal looks like. So this is your general one in red. This is your temporal deriv derivative with a high positive load in this particular case, in this example. And when you sum the two, you get, again, a ball signal that just peaks a little bit earlier. So just by adding this temporal de derivative, we are having now a lot more information about what your actual ball signal looks like. But this is not the only um, domain in which bold signals can differ between each other. So, you know, some of them might be more spiky than others. Some of them might be narrower. Some of them might be flatter. And this is what the dispersion derivative is going to do. So this is our, our third function that we were seeing before. Um, so essentially, the dispersion derivative is going to give me information about the width of the bold signal. So here we see a different example. So um, if the dispersion derivative has a negative load, that means that my ball signal is narrower, however, so, so more spiky. However, if my dispersion derivative was positive loaded, my ball signal would be flatter. So now with the temporal and the dispersion derivatives, we can like sort of um, sum them to the canonical response function, and then we get a ball signal that looks more like the, what we're looking for. Uh, good. There you go. Right. So now you might be wondering, well, uh, but how do you know, um, you know, what set of temporal basis function is better for my data, right? Like, as you said, if you were, um, you're probably always going to uh, use the one, uh, the last one that we've looked at. Uh, but even then, like, you might be interested in knowing, you know, like, what is the effect of, like, accounting for all these different, you know, derivatives and all these different loads? Uh, so here we see an example. Uh, so this is a um, study where um, participants were uh, presented with images in the scanner, uh, and they were uh, suggested, it was, they were instructed, sorry, to press a button as soon as they saw a face. So as soon as they saw a face, they had to uh, uh, press a button. So essentially what uh, the authors did here is just fit, um, you know, like your usual, like canonical uh, response fun functions here. Uh, and if you just look at, you know, like the canonical response functions without any derivatives, without any information about, you know, like the, the latency of the shape of the ball signal, you're just looking at your good old ball signal, like the, 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 the normal one. What you see, your results, 
uh, look like pretty much what you would expect to see. So you see activation in the motor cortex and you see activation in the visual cortex. So they are seen, it's a visual task, so that makes sense. And they're instructed to press a button when they see a face. So it may also makes sense that the motor cortex would activate. And this is great. However, if now we look at data where uh, the fits particularly well where the mother has a positive load on the temporal derivative, this means where the bold signal peaks early, what we see now is that an additional part of the visual cortex activates, and this is to be a part of the secondary visual cortex, and maybe you know show what this um, what their uh, interpretation of this was. But is uh, a, this a part of the cortex that you know like, uh, integrates information about visual stimuli, but also like sustain attention, for example? So it could be that you know that this area is like monitoring constantly for the stimulus of interest, so maybe it just speaks earlier. Now, if we looked at um, parts of the brain where the data fits particularly well in model where the um, uh, dispersion derivative has a positive load, so you know, like where the, the bold signals are flatter, we see again the visual cortex, we see a little bit of the motor cortex, but what we see now is areas of the basal ganglia that are um, uh, lighting up, so things like you know, the hippocampus. And then uh, lastly, if you were looking at uh, parts of the brain where the ball signal seems to not fit any of this and it seems to not like has these like weird undershoot here that lasts forever, uh, you will end up with pretty much nothing, um, which is uh, which is good news. It means that most of our ball signals look like what we would expect them to look like. Um, but you have you have like a few voxels here in the prefrontal cortex that still seem to you know follow a different sort of like shape. Um, and this could be, I don't know, this could be uh, for many reasons. Also, the prefrontal cortex has particularly different um, distortions when it comes to um, fMRI, but that is that is a talk for another time. Um, but yeah, in general, this comes to prove that you know, like just using a canonical function plus these two uh, derivatives, you can pretty much model anything that you're interested in that is particularly uh, relevant for your uh, task. So enough about temporal basis functions. Uh, let's talk a bit about a topic that um, you most likely need to think uh, when you model your data, but also and specifically you want to think about uh, when you are the earliest stages of designing your experiment. And this is timing issues. And this is a main problem in, in fMRI, right? Because uh, let's remember that when you run, when you do fMRI, when you acquire fMRI images, uh, most of the time during echoplanar imaging, so EPI, that would be probably the case for most of you. You don't acquire a full image of the brain at once. So you don't acquire a full snapshot of your brain at once. Like what you acquire is slices one at a time, and then you stack them together to get a full image of your brain. And at the time that it takes you to stack all those images together to acquire a full image of your brain would be your repetition time. So in this case here, your repetition time, your TR is four seconds. This means that it takes you four seconds um, to uh, acquire a full image of the brain. But what does this mean? This means that for the same stimuli, if we sample the both responses at different times in different parts of the brain, right? So if following a stimulus, the first slice I acquire corresponds to the top of the brain, and the last one corresponds to the bottom of the brain, you will be consistently sampling the bold signal less than a second following the stimulus on the top of the brain and more than three seconds later at the bottom of the brain. And this is a problem. <clears throat> Not only because you are not sam sampling both signals equally across the entire brain, but also because you're consi consistently uh, missing the pick. So if you have your stimulus here and you're consistently acquiring um, information on the same part of the brain four seconds later and eight seconds later, for example, on the top, you're consistently missing the pick for that particular region of the ball signal for that specific stimulus. And that is a problem. That's not really what you want to do. Like you, what you really want to do is sample the ball signal across all this area here so that you can capture the peak at least a portion of the time. So I'm not saying every time, but at least you need to attempt to do it a portion of the time. Uh, so there are two ways in which you can account for this. Uh, so one is to present your stimulus somewhere in between two TRs. So instead of locking your stimuli to the beginning of your TRs, for instance, like your stimuli up here, a second zero, second four, second eight, in this particular example, you can present um, your stimuli like one TR and a half. 
So that way um, you are not just locking your stimuli to like always the same part of the brain at the same time point. And that way you are most likely to uh, sample your ball signal at different parts of the function. And then the other option is that we apply a random jitter. So instead of presenting them in example every second exactly, we introduce a random variation, for instance, like for between minus two and two, for example. So sometimes stimuli, stimuli are presented a little bit early uh, and sometimes are presented a little bit later at a random rate. And with high enough number of stimuli, you can be more certain that you are going to be able to sample the whole ball signal across, across its peak. Um, and, you know, the second option is, uh, for instance, the one I usually do, um, but you can do either of those. <clears throat> there we go. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about um, slice timing issues. I introduced this earlier. I went a little bit ahead of myself. But then here on the left, uh, you can see an example of how we actually acquire images in the brain. So you don't acquire the whole image at once, so you acquire slices. In this case, it's going to be from the top to the bottom, so it's going to uh, acquire 16 slices that take a total of two seconds. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry. Um, and we know that in two seconds, a lot of stuff can happen. Uh, we can see an example here in this graph in the middle. Uh, that the signal on the first slice can be here, whereas the signal on the bottom slice can be a lot higher for the exact same stimulus. So really what we need to do is model each slice separately so that we can account for these like slightly differences. So we can give SPN information about which slices should be modeled first so we can account for these differences in our GLM. Um, it's something that we can do so during the analysis of our data, um, and all we need to do is tell SPM what our reference slice is, which would be D0. So which slice um, we want to model first. Um, so here we see an example. So like here you see, <clears throat> sorry, here you see a really um, um, good example of how, um, how you model your data and where you uh, select your reference slice to be is going to make a huge impact on your results. So here for the same, for the exact same data set, for the exact same task, all the people have done, all the authors here have done different is uh, on, one's, on one uh, occasion, select the top slice as your reference slice. And in the other case, they've selected the bottom slice uh, as their reference slice. And you can see here that the, the, the uh, activation that you can see here on the top of the brain has sort of disappeared at the expense of, so now it seems like the model is more sensitive to capture signals at the bottom of the brain now. What is this trying to tell me? <clears throat> that if you have um, a particular interest in your data analysis about, you know, top parts of the brain, sort of like sensory areas of the brain, for instance, imagine, uh, maybe um, you should uh, select your top slice as your reference slice. If you were interested in lower parts of the brain, the uh, areas of the brain that are at the bottom, maybe you should uh, select your bottom slice as your reference slice. If you're interested in the whole brain or you don't have a particular hypothesis of where you are, um, you know, where you think that you're going to find activation, then just uh, select your middle slice or select, and, and then you are going to be able to minimize those bias. Um, so, but what is the solution that um, SPM offers? So uh, beyond, you know, uh, where you start doing your analysis from and what you put in the model. Um, so you can do this through the preprocessing of your data um, and it's called slice timing correction. So what this really means um, uh, is that the timings of your time series, you are shifted a little bit to account for these little differences and like these different offsets in, uh, in timing. And then SPM interpolates them to create a new ball time series that is corrected for these different time shifts. Um, some, um, it's a very common step to do, and it seems to account very well for these differences in timing. Some people uh, might be a little bit aware of like, you know, interpolating their, their ball signals already at the level of preprocessing. So then perhaps they prefer just, uh, you know, like uh, rely on their reference slice um, to, you know, to model their data. But this is an option that is going to be up to you. This is also going <clears> to... <throat> And this is going to depend on, you know, like what your TR is, you know, if your TR is longer or if your TR is shorter, obviously that is going to affect how um, slice timing correction um, will interpolate your data. For very long TRs, the interpolation of your data might actually affect 
posterior inference, so maybe you need to hold on. Uh, but in general terms, unless you've done something very, you know, um, out of the norm, usually slice timing correction is something that you can do, and it works quite well. And we can see later on the um, um, on the practicals what that looks like. Right, and this takes me to um, the very um, the very uh, end of this talk, the way we can wrap up everything that we've covered here. And with how, how we use all this information to our advantage to make sure that our model is as efficient as possible. <clears throat> and um, to begin with, we're going to start talking um, about ball signals in terms of frequencies. Um, so just bear with me. If you, if you uh, look at the ball signal right here, so here we have our ball response function that we've looked at a million times now, and we see that it, it, from the moment it peaks and it decays and it goes back to baseline, um, around 32 seconds happen. Uh, so essentially you have a full cycle of a ball signal every 32 seconds. Cycles per second is a, a measure of frequency, so hertz. So essentially one cycle per 32 seconds equals 0 0.04 hertz, which is what we have here. So if you actually looked at your ball, uh, your ball response function as a measure of frequency, as a function of frequency, what you end up here is really a low pass filter. So essentially things that happen slowly pass through the filter and things that happen, um, so th things that happen quickly pass through the filter. And uh, yeah, I've, I've done a deal around, sorry. Um, but you get, you get the gist. So uh, if you looked at the ball signal as a function of frequency, then what you end up is with a, a low pass filter here. Um, so why is this important and what we need to take, what we should be taking uh, this into account? Because the frequency at which I present my stimuli is gonna have an effect of how much data is actually gonna make it into the model. For instance, here, if imagine that these are the stimuli that I'm presenting in the scanner, um, and this is stimuli that, you know, like go on gradually and then it goes off gradually and then it goes on gradually. So, like, you know, like the whole um, sort of cycle here takes around 24 seconds, something like that, 24, 25 seconds. So that's around 0 0.04 hertz, uh, which we see on our delta. So all our frequency, our frequency in which we are presenting our stimuli, are contained within the frequency of 0 0.04, which casually is also the preferred frequency for the ball signal. This is the frequency at the most ball signal is usually contained, as we've seen before. So if we convolve the two, our model, you can be sure that it's going to contain all our data in those frequencies because our frequencies are moving within the ball data preferred frequency. So a stimulus that looks like that um, would be very optimal, very efficient uh, for our design. If now we look at a different type of stimulus, so here we have sort of like a more like a block design. So we have um, sort of 18 seconds of nothing, then we have stimulation, then we have nothing, then we have stimulation, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially it takes around, you know, 34 something like that um, seconds to to contain, uh, to uh, uh, complete one cycle. That's mean, that means that, again, most of our frequency of our stimuli are going to be contained within 0 0.04, which is the preferred frequency of our ball signal. But then we're going to have other frequencies that are a bit higher. And this, these are going to have to do with things like, you know, sharp edges, like from no stimulation to stimulation. Um, however, when we convolve the two, like when we like multiply, and we see that most of our data still stays. Most of our data still makes it into the model because most of our data was contained within the preferred frequencies of our ball signal. So still, block design, quite efficient. We lose information maybe about the block sharp edges, but we're not so interested in that anyway, usually. However, um, it, the, the fact that block design is efficient doesn't mean that it's always going to be efficient. And I'm gonna show you an example here. So what we have here is a block design similar to what we had before, um, but long, very long. So essentially here we had 
80 seconds of nothing and then we have 80 seconds of stimuli and then we that will be followed by 80 seconds of nothing so essentially it takes like full 80 seconds to complete a cycle what does this mean that the frequency is really low it takes a long time for cycles to get completed the frequency domain the do dominant frequency is going to be here very very low and another thing we need to take into account about the the bold response function is that by default we usually would do a high pass filter this is this is what i mean by this um, usually by default what we would do is eliminate very 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 low frequencies and why do we do that because these are the frequencies where usually the most amount of noise is contained so things like physiological noise things like a slow pace movement things like that would be on the low frequency domain so we usually just want to get rid of them as soon as possible if by accident we design our experiment in which our blocks uh, take too long to complete a cycle, which means that, you know, like our frequency, the mind, our dominant frequency is really low, we're literally going to get rid of it um, as soon as we start doing our analysis because of this hyper filter that I was saying about, which means the very, very little data makes it into your model at the very end. So this is very ineffective, which means that, you know, the chunkier, the better, it does not apply in this situation, in this scenario. So you need to be aware of, you know, like the length of your blocks. Now here, uh, we have a different scenario where we have uh, like the, your delta function, your spikes that represent different uh, events, and they're presented at a random SOA. So you know, like we're jittering um, um, the space in between stimuli. What does this mean? That the time that it takes to complete a cycle varies. So sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's somewhere in between. What does that mean? That the frequencies uh, where our stimuli are presented are also very spread across the whole range. So we don't have one specific um, like time that it takes to complete a cycle. We have lots of different times that it takes to complete a cycle. So lots of different frequencies. When we convolve that with the bold response function, what we have like, yes, we do lose some frequencies on the, the top frequencies here, uh, but we also contain a lot of them. And um, so, you know, um, Although like you are losing something, you're still keeping a lot. So this um, comes to show the importance of trying to add, uh, you know, like a jitter, like an, um, a random variation in the way you present in the SOAs, in the way you present your stimuli. Another way uh, in which you can, so this is one way in which you can test the, the efficiency of your design before you collect any data. Right. So you can just you literally you can compute those functions before you collect any data, before you start doing your, your study. This is another way in which you can do it, which I know um, this um, looks like a like very long, um, very long uh, formulas uh, at this time of the of the talk. Um, but essentially, all that is saying here is that another way of making sure that your um, that your model is efficient is by making sure that your t statistics are as high as possible right like this is the dream this is what we always want um and like the t for for any given contrast your t statistic is going to be um your weighted parameter estimate divided by by its standard error so one way of making your t contrast as high as possible is by reducing the standard error and this is something that we can simulate. So by taking into account this, um, um, these equations, we can sort of simulate input, like simulated data, and we can see what, for any given contrast, um, what our, um, our standard would, would look like, and therefore like what our, um, our t-statistic um, could reach. Uh, but then again, this might not be something that you want to do straight away if you are just starting getting to uh, fMRI design, uh, but you should know that if you wanted to, if you wanted to like calculate, you know, uh, simulated um, t statistics, if you wanted to know like what is the potential for your design, you can do that in advance. You can do that before you start collecting data. And here is an example. Um, so you are, if you were very determined to simulate your design uh, to test the efficiency of a, of a particular contract of interest. In this case, let's see that we're looking at, you know, like pleasant, pleasant, pleasant images minus unpleasant images. Um, you can predetermine what the minimum uh, SOA is, so the minimum time between trials, and the probability of each event happening um, uh, to, you know, to actually occur. 
so, and then you can with those um, with that information you can calculate the efficiency of your model. So if you had here, imagine that you want to present images every ten seconds or every eight seconds, and then every eight seconds this is deterministic. They're definitely going to occur. There's a hundred percent probability that this is going to occur. And if you compute the efficiency for that, you see that the efficiency is that is actually not that efficient. And we already have seen why having fixed SOAs are not the best time, are not the best thing to do. Um, so let's try something else. So what if we had a completely random jitter? So like the SOAs could be anything, and each one of those SOAs had a 50% probability of appear. Well, then our efficiency gets a little bit better, but it could be better. What we actually can do is assign maximum probabilities to certain SOAs. So there are certain inter stimulus intervals that are going to be more probable than others. And then we kind of allocate sort of like dynamically, like we allocate um, more or less probabilities of other um, SOAs to appear around this main one. And that way we can create sort of like our cycle look, um, and which is what we're seeing here. So we can see like small cycles, higher, and even longer. So this one here would be our, you know, like 24 second cycle, which gives us the most efficient, uh, once again, uh, the most out of these three, the most efficient uh, design. And then at the end, we have our block design, which we have seen before that, you know, is one of the most efficient ways of uh, modeling your data. Um, but as, as sort of we've covered during the last hour, uh, block design sometimes are not advisable uh, or possible, maybe because of the nature of your design. Uh, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you know like you need to go for a full randomized event related design. Like you can choose something in between that can help you you know like achieve um, more efficiency in your design, which is essentially what we're seeing here. Right, and lastly, the last thing that we're gonna cover here, and it's only gonna take me a couple of minutes, uh, so don't worry, uh, we're almost there. Um, so the last thing that we need to take into account is like, right, so you're telling me about, you know, like how much I need to space apart my design, my, my trials, and you're telling me how should I should group them and how long my, ball, uh, my block should be, and that's all great. But then like, what if I have different conditions? How do I know how to, you know, how to arrange them, you know, like how to put them one uh, uh, after the other. How do I sequence my trials? Uh, do I put all my unpleasant faces first, uh, unpleasant images first, and then all my pleasant images? Do I interleave them? Well, um, that is also that you can, uh, that is also something that you can uh, check in advance. Uh, so imagine that A here in this example uh, mean uh, pleasant images, uh, and B means unpleasant images. If we wanted the trials to be presented completely at random, which is what we're doing here, this formula here, like what, what we can um, what we can calculate here is what SOA, what uh, interstimulus interval is the most efficient for each contrast of interest. So in this case, imagine that I'm interested in knowing what's the effect of uh, pleasant face, uh, pleasant images minus unpleasant images. Well, if I'm interested in that contrast and I present my event in a completely random manner, the most efficient SOA is probably going to be something really, really short, like something around two seconds. However, if I was interested on the same design, if I was interested in knowing what's the effect of um, uh, pleasant face, uh, pleasant images and unpleasant images, then our SOA would need to be a lot longer in order for my design to be a little bit um, um, more efficient than zero, really. And that is, you know, like that is almost 15 seconds between trials, which we know and we've already said that is, is not something that we can afford. But there's another thing that we can do. So if you had... Oh, if you had a third type of trial, that is we're going to call a null event, which is essentially just a pause, a, a break. Um, so essentially you add a third type of trial here. Um, and therefore, like if you completely randomize the order of your of your events, you have a one in three possibilities of your event to appear. Uh, and if you calculate like, the efficiency of your model, you'll see that now for uh, the main effect of pleasant images, so A minus, minus B, your most optimal SOA will sit here, again, like around like two seconds. And now your most optimal SOA for the combined effect of pleasant images and unpleasant images is also really low. 
So by including um, little breaks in your design, you're actually making your design more efficient to capture different, um, different effects of interest. And that's usually going to be the case, right? Like you're very rarely going to do a design and you're just going to be interested in one contrast. You usually want to look at different effects. Uh, so you really want to take this into account and make sure that you choose a design that is going to be able to account, that is going to be optimal, not just in general, but for each contrast particularly. And here we're simply seeing another uh, example. So if you were to like inter alternate pleasant and unpleasant images, uh, you see that you know like your S your more optimal SO would look in one way. And if you wanted to permute or pseudo randomize uh, the order of your of your faces, then uh, that the optimal SOA would be right here. So think about the way in which you want to uh, present your images. Think about what contrast of interest you have because that is going to largely dictate like how much space you need to leave in between your um, in between your uh, events. And this is sort of like a conclusion um, um, a slide uh, with, you know, um, sort of like wrapping up everything that we've just said. Uh, our optimal design for one contrast might not be for another. Uh, and block designs are generally the most efficient one but you need to be careful with making them too chunky. Too chunky is not gonna be that good for you. So just, if, if you don't have any particular hypothesis, just choose like 20, 30 seconds, that's probably gonna do the job. Um, so sometimes uh, psychological efficiency dictates intermixed designs uh, and sets limits to SOAs, which is something that I've also covered. Um, with random designs, optimal SOA for differential effects is minimal. Whereas for a main effect is a lot longer. So you also need to take that into account. Um, oh, there you go. Um, include breaks if you can, because if you are interested in these both um, in these both effects, that that is going to allow you to like group your events a little bit closer together, which is something that, especially when you have limited time in scanner, you want to do. Um, and if the if the inter stimulus interval is constrained, then pseudo randomized designs can be more optimal for that, which is the last example that we saw. So hopefully we've just blasted through the main things that you need to know about event related designs. Um, I've tried to make this into an hour. Um, and you know again, if you if you find it difficult to you know like to understand these functions, to understand all the different elements, all the different you know statistics, parameters, all that we are talking about, just try to think about the concepts, try to think about what we are trying to do. Um, and don't worry because SPM will do the math for you. So, you know, like as long as you know the concept, you don't necessarily need to do exactly how to convolve one function with another. Uh, so that would be my advice in case that uh, all of this is becoming very daunting to you. So yeah, happy to answer questions and I'll see you later in the practical.